And I'll give book hope and stuff with a little big net about how that the Indian dress style has changed very little. Gandhi, I mean, later in rather volume two of the book, Gandhi wears the, the Indian dress, the Indian habit, and it's uh, usually very light in color. Again, you know, all of you hopefully know from your physics, physics classes that white reflects heat. And also it's very loose fitting. And again, India is a hot country, except for the far north regions in the mountains. Otherwise, India is a hot country. And uh, India has a hot climate, so the dress is designed to keep them cool. Very utilitarian. Um, the Mauryan dynasty had, uni had unified India. Um, let's see, your book that runs a chapter from the Mauryans to the Mughals. Um, the Mauryans had unified India, then India went through a period um, of disunity for several centuries. In the 100s, the Mauryan dynasty was overthrown and it ruled from the time of Alexander the Great until shortly after Christ. Then they went through a period of centuries of disunity. Now again, if, if you had grown up in India, you would be studying Indian history and learn it in this period there was this group and in that period there was that group and in another period there's another group and basically the boundaries changed every generation. Um, one nation be powerful this generation then it would totter and the next another nation become powerful. A whole lot of disunity. A few dynasties would unite part of India, but no dynasty ever united the um, entire peninsula. Uh, your book mentions the Kushan dynasty, the Gupta dynasty, and I'll tell you what, I'm not going to ask you to learn those names. Uh, but they, they just know that the India have went through a period of kings, various kings, various dynasties. Um, and these dynasties would come and would go as have all dynasties through history, while India languished in a period of disunity. Well, in the 10 hundreds, I'll try to draw, this is basically India, I mean, you know, this, I don't have a map. In about the 10 hundreds, Islam started making inroads into India, <coughs> and Islam was to get in all of northern India. What is today Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh, the uh, Islam was to get these countries, or what is today these three countries, they did not conquer all of India. The main part of India, and again part of this, might have had a lot to do with geography. Uh, if you know anything about the geography in India, this area, Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh are places that are have a lot of the type of territory that the Muslims were used to fighting in. But then you get into a territory with a lot of thickets and vines and trees and vegetation. And Muslim armies have not done well in those kind of regions. And no Muslim armies have never done well fighting against a country like Vietnam. Uh, again, because of the jungle fighting, and I have to say the United States did not do all that great fighting in Vietnam either. But anyway, the, uh, now, I've had at least one student from India tell me that when the Muslims came in, they forcibly converted the people they conquered at sword point. If you actually look in the detail about, about this issue, in some instances this was true, in others it wasn't. It varied from generation to generation and from location to location. In other words, there were some forced conversions and there were some conversions by persuasion and there were some places where there were no conversions at all. Some of the Islamic rulers who took over the northern part of India were tolerant of other faiths, particularly Hinduism, and some were not. So the uh, conflict between Hindu and Islam started during this period, and now this is the year 2016, and guess what? It is still going on. 2016, yeah, there's, there's India and Pakistan, India and Bangladesh are still at odds with each other. 
and uh, maybe for quite some time. <coughs> the people of India have accused the Pakistanis of terroristic activities, of, of uh, planting bombs in crowded markets and blowing up, blowing themselves and the people around them up. Yes, India has problems with terrorism also, and well, so does Pakistan. And by the way, the, the terrorists who attack Pakistan are not Indian folk. They're fellow Muslims, as is the case of the terrorists who attack Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. Uh, anyway, the um, Silk Road ran through India for a while, and of course now you all hopefully know the Silk Road the Silk Road joined China to the Mediterranean, and it was to run for, I guess, 2,000 or so years, joining the, the Chinese, and a lot of what they carried from China was silk. And a lot of Roman, European gold and silver found its way into Indian China, thanks to the Silk Road, thanks to the trade. And um, it, it enriched some people of India. There was actually at one point a Roman colony in India. But uh, you've have already told the story about how that the Roman uh, gold would la leave Rome, and a lot of Roman gold coins are still found in India and in China today. All right. Um, now, while the Islam was threatening to the north, oh, by the way, uh, in the case of Islam, the Islamic people came in riding on the backs of horses. India met them with elephants. You all hopefully know that the elephant is much bigger than a horse, but the horse proved to be a better battle weapon than the elephant. The horse was more for faster, and speed is very important in warfare because if you're faster than the enemy, you can decide whether to give battle or not. If you decide, well, the enemy is bigger than we are, let's just not fight, so you can always run when you're faster. When you're not faster, you don't have a choice. They attack you, and you have to fight whether you want to or not. So the, uh, the elephant eventually was replaced by the Indian uh, soldiers the elephant was replaced by the horse. And uh, this enabled the Indians to fight them off. Again, the fighting lasted for, well, it's gone on for years with no end in sight. Um, but in addition, Buddhism threatened Indian Hinduism. Uh, Buddhism became wealthy Buddhists became wealthy partly because they uh, did a lot of trade. And uh, the uh, Buddhist monks began to build elaborate, elaborate temples and elaborate monasteries. And folk, it appears, now I had a student some years back, back in 2004 or five or thereabouts, asked me to buy a book which I bought online. This book said that uh, a lot of European European churches appear to have copied Indian churches, and a lot of European monasteries appear to have copied Indian monasteries. So um, again, it looks like that the, the, there is more travel between India and Europe than the East, because uh, the <coughs> Indian people would build these elaborate, particularly the Buddhists would build these elaborate monasteries. And Christians would go back into Europe from India and uh, copy what they had seen in India. Uh, now, some of these uh, monasteries are carved into solid rock. In other words, they have a solid mountain rock wall, and they would go in and carve a temple inside. And the temple was, looks really elaborate. Uh, see one of you nodding your head like you know what I'm talking about. The temple is really, really an elaborate temple, but it is made of one big hollowed out rock. And uh, folk, we don't know how they did it. Again, indicating that the people of India um, uh, 
we don't know how they did it. Uh, but they, they carved out some pretty elaborate monasteries and pretty elaborate temples, most of which were Buddhist. And they booted Buddhism for a while threatened Hinduism. Um, now, um, when your book introduces you to a certain word for the first time that you'll see, particularly in European history, then you had some of this going on in India and some in Japan. Feudalism. Right, essentially what feudalism is, is where you have a figurehead king He has only power around his own little local uh, domain, figurehead, and under him are the nobles. Now in the case of Europe, you had the king, and then under the king were the dukes, some of the dukes were the counts, and under the counts might be the viscounts, the barons, the earls, uh, the marquis, different ranks of nobility. These nobles were the ones who actually governed the country and who were actually in charge. But uh, officially, they paid lip service to the figurehead king, and they would pretend that we're one united country when actually the king had very little authority over any of them. Every one of them did as he saw fit. This is basically feudalism, where the, uh, the nobles, each local nobleman or noble person runs the show. Um, so there's one king and one king? With one king, and under him, there might be hundreds of nobles each of them more or less independent king. They'll swear lip service to the king, but it's all a formality. Um, they, they worship the same gods, they speak the same language, so they have some semblance of unity, and maybe if a foreign invader comes in, they'll all forget their coils. But in feudalism, nobles often war against no nobles. I mean, it would be like in our country, for instance, if uh, Georgia was governed by the Duke of Georgia, and Tennessee by the Duke of Tennessee, and Alabama, the Duke of Alabama, and then under the Dukes would be the Count Gordon, Count Cobb, Count DeCab, and Count uh, oh, Count Fulton, uh, Count Henry, Count Green. I mean, you know, there's that Green County not far from us. Uh, you know, there was each of these counts. That's where we get to word county. Uh, each of these counts would uh, govern somewhat, even sometimes independently of their Duke. And uh, then under the counts would be various ranks of barons. Um, the Baron of Sandy Springs, the Baron of uh, Marietta, uh, the so forth. Um, and they would be the government, and each local magistrate, or each local nobleman would make up his laws. Um, make, up, make up his own laws. Now, um, Buddhism threatened partly because Buddhism was more egalitarian than Hinduism. Now, okay, of course, I had a woman from India tell me that Hinduism was an egalitarian religion. For those of us outside, it looks to be anything but. It's very hierarchical to us. We have your low people, low down, your high people, high up. And the caste you're born in is a caste you'll stay in. But nevertheless, from her point of view, Hinduism was very egalitarian. But nevertheless, uh, we'll. I won't argue the point right now, but uh, Buddhism actually was more egalitarian than uh, Hinduism. And um, Buddhism appealed to the uh, lower caste. Buddhism also taught that on the level of the soul, all four castes were equal. And uh, this was, this again had appeal. Um, now, there was a problem though with Buddhism. Buddhism, Buddhist sayings were not written down at all until 200 years after he had died. Whereas in the case of Jesus, some of his sayings started to be written down 20 years after he had uh, left the earth. So uh, that meant that there were people around who still remembered him. But 200 years, I mean, you're going back to 1816. Uh, James Monroe was president. Nobody today remembers him. Nobody today remembers anybody who was alive 200 years ago. But um, James Monroe was elected that year, it was election year. James Madison was president. James Monroe was elected in 1816. Now, it had been a long time ago. Well, 
after 200 years, there was a group over here who said, Buddha said this. But then another group of several miles away would say, no, Buddha said that. And then a third group, many miles from land, would say, no, Buddha said that. The fact is, we really don't know for sure, and even at that time, they did not know for sure what Buddha said. His sayings were passed down by word of mouth for 200 years, and finally, we'd better start writing them down. And they, still to this day, his followers cannot exactly agree on everything he said. The main teachings are probably there. Um, and then you had the problem that Buddhism had is a problem that all religions have. And I hope, I mean, uh, let's face it, every religion, as it gets so big, eventually splits. There's one group who followers, followers say that it ought to be done this way, another group that ought to be done that way. And uh, Buddhism was no exception. The big issue, and of course, if this sounds like Christianity, probably because it is, and it sounds like Islam also, it sounds like Confucianism, some people said we ought to adhere to the original teachings of Buddha. And other groups said, oh no, the world has changed since Buddha lived in it, uh, you know, a thousand, more than a thousand years ago, 15 of them. The world has changed, well, actually it's longer than that, from our, but I'm talking about a few that lived a thousand years ago. You say, well, Buddha lived 1600 years ago, and the world has changed in 1600 years. Well, we need to change with it. So again, this is a problem that all religions have to some extent. Customs change, science changes, Conditions change, um, and uh, a lot of people do not know how a religion can manage to change. So, um, Buddha, um, Buddha's somewhat abstract concepts began to be replaced with uh, more, you might say, concrete concepts. Buddha went from being a sage, all right, to religious followers, I mean, probably religious. Religious leaders, uh, sorry, here's the meaning of the word sage. The word sage means great teacher. Good teacher. The Buddha started as a sage, prophet. This is the person who claims to have heard from their God. Mohammed is considered by his followers to be a prophet and enters divinity. Where the uh, founder is said to have become God himself. Um, and anyway, Buddha started out as a sage, and he went from being a sage to being a divinity and from, among some of his followers. He became God, he became God himself, uh, whereas originally he was a teacher. He came to be looked on as a divinity. And um, the, abs the concept of uh, nirvana began to mean heavenly salvation, which you could achieve by a certain amount of works. Um, some people, uh, Buddhism began to split. Um, again, some people would say that uh, the split was due to the fact that uh, Buddhist teachings on equality ran counter to the Hindu belief in hierarchy, ran counter to the Hindu practice of uh, of some people being better than other, you know, or basically ran counter the caste system. Um, also, Buddhism demanded a whole lot of rituals, and your hard-working people at the very bottom didn't have time to do all those rituals that Buddhism demanded. So uh, you have a case where that, uh, again, folk, uh, I don't know how to make this interesting to all of you, but if any of you study religions, and I have, you find that these religions all have a whole lot in common. They get to where after a while they start arguing over how much of our founders' teachings do we adhere to, how much do we change, uh, what do we do when we, uh, for instance, in the case of Islam, they discovered tobacco because Muhammad had not run into tobacco and it had to decide, well, is tobacco okay or not? They finally decided it wasn't, but uh, that's not part of Muhammad's original teaching. You, you have all this with every religion. Uh, new inventions are made. New customs come into being. They run into other peoples who are different and they wonder how much of what the other people's customs do we adopt? How much can we not adopt? Um, also, Buddhism denied the existence of the soul, which ran counter to Hindu belief. Um, while Buddhism continued to appeal to the untouchables, this uh, appeal didn't, ran counter to the upper classes. And let's face it, folk, being human like we are, 
your religion, any religion that you might found, has to appeal to the leaders, the upper caste, in order to make a whole lot of headway and keep a whole lot of headway. Uh, Buddhism did not. All right. Um, again, didn't like the caste system. So to make a long story short, Buddhism threatened Hinduism for a time. Then Buddhism fell to the background. And Hinduism became once again a dominant. Now Hinduism had to make some adaptations owing to the threat of Buddhism. And the Hinduism began to lessen its rituals and appeal more to the lower caste. And eventually Buddhism became a second-rate religion in India. However, Buddhist missionaries went into Southeast Asia, which we'll talk about next. And Buddhism became the dominant religion of places like Korea, Vietnam, the Philippines, and particularly in Indonesia, Myanmar, what is today, Myanmar, Cambodia, these regions, the islands in the East Indies. Buddhism became very prominent, if not the dominant religion in those places, but it declined in India. All right, Hinduism changed its ways, and it played a role in the decline of Buddhism. Hindu rituals, which had once been only for the upper, upper caste, became uh, accessible to all caste. This helped uh, make Hinduism more popular. Um, and it's possible that competition from Buddhism forced Hinduism to open up to all caste. Again, uh, it's like factories, competition makes them, it forces them to make a better product because when you have two companies or three or four making automobiles, if one company makes a really, really bad car, after a while their business will go down. Or if you have six companies making air conditioners and one of them makes an inferior air conditioner, after a while the people realize and quit buying that kind of air conditioner. So um, religion is the same way, particularly in America and well, Western Europe, churches have to compete anymore for members. So churches have to be as user friendly as possible. The same way with uh, Hinduism and Buddhism in India. They, uh, Buddhism forced Hinduism to make some changes. Then, um, well, when Islam came on the march and back to Islam again, they caught the people of India unprepared to resist them. Uh, Hindu leaders, Indian leaders, they were quarreling among themselves for a while. And then when, when Islam got a lot of northern India, it forced the rest of the people of India to hey, say, we have to unite, we have to change. Again, they changed the military. They began riding horses into battle instead of elephants. Um, But what really stopped the Indian, what really stopped the Muslim advance was Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan, after he'd conquered part of China, his army spread out and some of them went to Russia, some of them went to the Middle East, and some of them went to India. You know, he fanned out all over the place. And he caught the Muslim world unprepared, and also Genghis Khan's uh, hordes, his, uh, I'll call them, well, the, the, the word generally used is horde. I mean, they don't call them soldiers, uh, but even though they were disciplined and they were trained, but they were really, really fierce fighters. They fought in squads of 10. So if a person would be executed if he left his squad of 10. So they fought in squads of 10, something that uh, Muslims had not done. And they were extremely good horsemen. They would swoop down and they caught the Muslim world unprepared. And in fact, as I've already mentioned, Genghis Khan's Mongolians might have destroyed Islam completely. Uh, some way put on a test that he converted to Islam. No, I'm afraid not. But his followers, several of his followers did. Um, but uh, he caught the Muslim world um, uh, by a surprise. Where was he from? He was from Mongolia. Genghis Khan is from Mongolia. You know, it was in this region on the other side of China from India. You know, quite a ways distance from India. 
I mean, you have uh, India, then above India you have Tibet, and then uh, above Tibet you have Mongolia. Uh, but Tibet is now part of China and has been off and on down through the ages. He conquered China and then spread out. He, yeah, he, he conquered, but well, first of all, he united Mongolia, something that no leader of Mongolia ever ever do. He united Mongolia. Then he next went to China and partially conquered China. But before he finished conquering China, his army spanned out and he conquered Russia and held Russia for 200 years. We'll talk about that later. And uh, then he went to the Muslim world and did a lot to make, make, make havoc among the Muslims. And he went into northern India and stopped. You know, he did not get to India itself, but he, he forced the Muslims to fight him instead of fighting the Indians. And this kept gave relief to some of the Indians. Now, uh, one of, a man named Tamerlane. Now, some people say he was descended from Genghis Khan or Genghis Khan's grandson. I do not know if this has been proven or even can be proven, but Tamerlane was a conqueror himself, and he built up quite a large empire that included a whole lot of Muslim territory. And uh, again, this help, Tamerlane helped keep give India, you might say, some respite. Um, And India was able to uh, avoid being conquered, and again, in part because, I think a lot of it was your geography, in part because they changed their ways of fighting, in part because Genghis Khan and the Mongolians came, and then in part because Tamerlane came. So India was spared being conquered by Islam. However, however, in the year 5th, pardon me, 1498, six years after Christopher Columbus, a bunch of dirty, ragged, European, Portuguese sailors arrived in India from Portugal. They had sailed around Africa, proving to be done. Vasco da Gama by name, we're about to name, but these are their, they were Portuguese. Now, where this is significant, when the Indians first saw them coming in, I mean, they came in on a dirty, old, ragged ship, and their sailors were suffering from scurvy, and uh, basically they were filthy. They had no idea that these Europeans were eventually going to conquer them. But this was the beginning. The Portuguese came around Africa, 1498. Within 300 years, Great Britain conquered India. Now, about Great Britain's conquest of India, I hope all of you know that Great Britain once had 13 colonies here in North America, and Georgia was one of the colonies. And Great Britain lost its 13 colonies in North America. So to kind of get even or get back and having lost her 13 North American colonies, including Georgia, Great Britain moved into India. And Lord Cornwallis, who had surrendered and given Americans a victory at Yorktown, Lord Cornwallis also was sent to India and he helped the British conquer India. The British were to hold India until 1947 for about 150, about 160 years. And if you look at an old, old map of India, They'll show you how that Britain was the ruler of India. And if you look at the king list of England, you'll find that Queen Victoria, King Edward VII, King George V, uh, and George VI were all emperors of India also. But under George VI reign, Britain lost India. But uh, actually, uh, beginning with George IV and William IV, and then from there to Victoria, these are these Kings and queens all held the title, Emperor or Empress of India. Yes? So, the Portuguese conquered India first? No, the Portuguese did not conquer India. The problem with Portugal, Portugal was just to go, Portugal was ideally suited to be the first European country because it was on the end of Europe. But you see on the map where it's on the far tip of the end of Europe, but it was just too small. But then follow, following the Portuguese came the Dutch, the French, and uh, of course, if when you take second semester world history, you learn that the British conquered India. The Dutch conquered the East Indies. The British conquered India. The, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just, uh, the, these European countries conquered the Far East countries. The Dutch conquered East Indies. Don't worry about taking it down. But the Dutch conquered the East Indies. That's more for second semester world history. And then, um, oh, the French conquered Vietnam. And uh, Let's see, and well, Britain found Australia and still holds Australia. Britain discovered Australia. Um, 
In other words, these European countries, oh yeah, and Spain conquered the Philippines to the United States took it from them in 1898. So uh, European countries began a conquest of these nations, including India. So what Islam could not do, European countries wound up doing, yes? So when you say Islam saved India, I just don't understand that. Islam did not save India, Islam was saved from being conquered by India. Uh, here's how, again, I'll repeat. Uh, when Islam came into India, number one, India changed its ways of fighting, but then uh, Genghis Khan came and forced the Islamic people to fight him instead of fighting. And India was down here, far away from Genghis Khan, so India was not invaded by Genghis Khan. The Mongolians did not invade India, but they did invade India's neighbors, and that kept India from having to... Oh, like Pakistan. Yeah, based, yeah, Pakistan and Nepal and Bangladesh. Then came Tamerlane, and he did something similar after Genghis Khan. Tamerlane also made a big, a big empire, the area of Pakistan and Nepal, and uh, what is today uh, a part of Afghanistan. Tamerlane conquered this region, and again, that gave India some respite, because uh, the, these Muslims had to spend their time either joining Tamerlane or fighting against him, one or the other, and they didn't have time for India. But then what really did India in was the Europeans. They came in beginning in 1498, and by the late 1700s, all of India was conquered by Great Britain. Again, the British had much better weapons, much better rifles, much better cannon that the Hindu people lacked. You said they discovered in Australia? The British discovered Australia, yeah, the man's name was Captain James Cook, but that was in the 1700s when Captain Cook accidentally bumped into Australia and didn't know where he was. So this is like a British territory? It is still, well, it's no longer territory. They were in the, more or less in the middle, but they still have big ties to Great Britain. But they're it's still. They are, it's like Canada, okay. If you're looking at Canada is still affiliated with Great Britain largely, and so is Australia. They never were declared independent. None like the United States. Canada never declared its independence. So they have their own parliament, though, and they, well, they use their own money and they do their own trading. Uh, Australia trades on the world market, so does Canada. They don't use the British pound, in other words. So they're, for all practical purposes, they're independent. They don't have any government affiliation with Britain? Some. A loose one, yes. Very loose. Uh, all right. Um, Now, your book goes on to describe how the um, Indians and the Muslims got along. Um, they copied each other. A lot of it, I mean, the, at first, a lot of it was contradictory. The Indian governments would say that they were united, but then they, in practice they were disunited. The Islamic people insisted you must obey the rulers, so that was one difference. Also, a lot of times the Indian kings claimed to be divine. The uh, Muslims rulers were not looked on as divine. Um, where the Islam took over, persons who did not convert to Islam had little chance of getting a government job. They only hired Islamic people where they didn't force you to convert. Um, now, your book says, and folk, again, this was written, most of what your authors wrote was written some 20 years ago, now they've upgraded. And uh, I don't know how they would handle it, but the, the your authors want to emphasize just how tolerant Muslim rulers were. Um, but they admit that non-Muslims were required to pay a tax called a jizya. You know, it wasn't just Christians who had to pay this tax. So, by the way, it's a J. J-I-Z-Y-A. This tax was only paid by non-Muslims. It was designed to help keep Muslims richer than non-Muslims in any society. Um, the two religions were different. One difference was uh, Hinduism had priests, Islam had none. Uh, I'll write this down, priest. Another difference was uh, Islam was egalitarian, Hinduism was not. This was another, another difference was Muslims eat beef, 
Hindus do not. Um, also, Indian art oftentimes featured da nude dancing women, and they are appear to be vulgar to the uh, Muslims, immoral, indecent. And uh, this created a few problems between the Hindus and the uh, Muslims. Um, Islam is mono, yeah, monotheistic. Hinduism is polytheistic. You know, there are differences there. So there were some differences. Um, some Muslim rulers, though, eventually found the idea of claiming that he was a divine king appealing, and some Muslim rulers began to copy the Hindu practice of claiming they were divine. Um, again, another change that they made was the Hindu Rahas eventually learned that horses made better battle weapons than elephants. Also, in the uh, area of the women, Muslim men would keep their women in isolation and seclusion. And a lot of Hindu men decided, hey, this is a great practice, and they would copy also. Folk, again, this is in your book. And uh, so, some Muslim men, I mean some Hindu men, started keeping their wives in seclusion. Now, another practice that the British had to deal with, um, the practice where that uh, when a wife died, she was expected to build a big fire, her family built a big fire, and she was expected to throw herself on a fire and burn herself to death when her, when her husband died. This practice did not change under Islam. It was left for the British. The British were told by the rest of the world, hey, this we consider this practice immoral. And I want to quote my high school history book. It said, if Britain tolerated these practices, they would meet with a disapproval of the civilized world. In fact, when that book was written 55 years ago, the authors considered the people of India to be uncivilized. And so we hope. But today, now, of course, the authors would not do that. But Great Britain had to deal with this practice. How do we stop the Indian women from throwing themselves on a flame when their husbands die? Uh, again, Islam apparently didn't care or didn't see. I mean, the Islamic men, women did not do that themselves, but they did not uh, stop the Hindu women from doing so. Essentially, the two groups, Hindu and Muslim, remained suspicious of each other. The relationships was like the relationship of conqueror and conquered, where that the um, Indian people who were conquered never reconciled. And a lot of people, you know, just, the people living in this country who did not want to convert to Islam, they moved down into India. Yes. Okay, so Islam never came to India. You're talking about that. It never conquered India. Now, Islam took on the outer fringes now, the northern part of India, but they never were able to get down in the main part of India Again, owing to the fact that Islam found itself distracted. So at first these regions were Hindu. Yeah, so in this part of India remained Hindu, and a lot of the persons living here who did not want to convert to Islam simply packed up and moved into India. And uh, they remain there to this day. So uh, this part of the world did not convert. And of course, when the British conquered India, the British did not demand conversions either. Uh, so India was destined to remain Hindu. Um, the caste system remained intact in India, and this was something even the British had trouble with. The British, I mean, they had three problems when they conquered India. Number one was how to deal with these women who wanted to throw themselves on a fire when husband's side. The British finally told the people of India, hey, this practice we find abhorrent. The other was the practice of child marriages. Men in middle-aged men, 30s and 40s, marrying nine-year-old girls. And uh, again, the West, the rest of the world told the British, you've got to stop this because this is un we think this is uncivilized. And uh, I will say this about Mary. Mohammed the prophet is documented he married a nine-year-old. But to keep in mind, though, folk, with all respect to Mohammed, a lot of this was going on at the time, and life was very, very short in those days. And when this girl died at the age of 16 after being married to Mohammed about seven years, Mohammed pined away and died shortly thereafter himself. Uh, but this this was a, I mean, this was, uh, anyway. You this think little girls were dying because they married to these old men? What's that? Uh, I don't know why Mohammed's one of, 
Uh, okay, Mohammed only had one wife until his first wife died. Then he married several women, including a nine-year-old girl. But then do you think that that's the reason why she died? That might be. I mean, okay, there are stories, but they cannot be verified about that she did not like him, she was mistreated, and there was a forced marriage, and she was basically paid or whatever. And uh, that might be a reason. But also, a lot of people, sanitation is not what it is, that a lot of young people died in the teens. Maybe now you feel that you do. No, uh, even, I mean, uh, and unlike today, where we don't have that many eight, nine, and 10 year olds die except for accident, in those days, people dropped out at every age, pretty much even at every age, with six, seven, eight, nine, up to 20. And yet they had people who didn't feel but they had, uh, they had a lot of persons who died at any age, owing to plagues, diseases, accidents, uh, various infections um, that we now can cure, things we now can cure. Okay, I've got to move on. Southeast Asia. Um, Southeast Asia has two big components. There's the mainland and there's the islands. The mainland is like Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, off the coast of China. And then there's um, the islands. Among the islands, there's Indon what today is Indonesia and the Philippines are the main ones. Now, this does not include Japan, even though Japan is islands. Um, this region attracted, it had one thing in common in the United States. It was a diverse region made up of diverse peoples and it attracted a lot of people immigrants down to the ages owing to its abundant water and very friendly climate and year-round growing season. You can plant any time of the year you want to and harvest any time you want to. Um, but unlike the United States, they never had a common language and did not have a common religion. And they never were able to unite until recently, at least Indonesia is united today. And I doubt seriously that even Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar could have united them because they had too many islands, too many mountains on the islands. The mountains were very, very steep and uh, difficult to get armies up and down those steep uh, slopes. So I doubt that um, any conqueror could have united them. So uh, they, um, they remained uh, distant. <coughs> I mean, they remained uh, disunited throughout much of their history. Um, the earliest peoples we know of who came there came around 2500 BCE, the Malay peoples, and that would have been before the rise of the Babylonian Empire, probably during Sumerian days. Then a thousand years later, around 1500 BCE, and other immigrants arrived. From about the year 100, the first century, 100 CE, first century after Christ, this area began to have a lot of contact with India owing the fact that uh, Indian traders would take their ships and visit this area. And uh, this area was rich in spices. And uh, Buddhist and Hindu missionaries came into this area. Originally, the religion of these people was probably animism. Animism is nature worship. The strong belief of animism is that everything is God. The animals are God. The trees are God. All life is God. And if they have to kill an animal to eat it, they'll perform a ceremony called an apology. Basically, I'm sorry I have to kill you, but I have to kill you to live. And then even when they eat a plant, they'll perform a ceremony of an apology to the plant that they have to eat. Uh, but uh, you know, everything is God. Animism is usually associated with primitive people. And the animistic people, some of them began to realize that, hey, the religion of the more advanced peoples, like Hinduism and Buddhism, is probably better than their own. So some of the more civilized among them converted from animism to Buddhism and Hinduism, with Buddhism becoming the dominant religion of this region, Southeast Asia. It had more of an appeal than the hierarchical Hinduism. These people, again, animistic people tend to be very egalitarian tribal peoples with no higher an office than the chief of their tribe, the chief and a shaman, and everybody else is pretty much equal. So uh, the idea of having a ranks, hierarchy of authority, hierarchy of the social classes did not appeal to, does not usually apply to animistic people. So Buddhism 
was destined to become the dominant religion of the civilized people of Southeast Asia with the people living in the, all right, you had your people living on a coastline, the cities, the big cities, they tended to be civilized. Then you go into the jungle and the farther deeper into the jungle you got, the less and less civilized these people were. And um, time would move very slowly with, for them with very little changes compared to the people outside who had a lot of changes. All right. Um, eventually some of these areas began to form into states. The first state we know of is the state of Funan. We don't know much about it, so I'm not going to write it down. Eventually more states came along and these states were influenced by trade with India and China. Now, in the middle of the jungle, right. I first became aware of this back around 1982 when I was at Lockheed, maybe 1983, when a friend of mine loaned me a National Geographic magazine, and the National Geographic was devoted to the city of Angkor Wat. And again, in my day, we did not study Far Eastern history, but uh, we should have, but we didn't. We were, all history was was Western history, United States history. But anyway, there was this European who was exploring the jungle one day, and all of a sudden he came into a huge, huge clearing. And inside this clearing was a huge, huge, <coughs> completely abandoned city. A six foot long black snake slid out across the street in front of him. He just ignored it. A tiger peered its head out the window from one of the buildings and looked at him. He stared at the tiger, but neither one of them bothered to fight each other. Um, he, made, he made note of the location of the city and went back and told his buddies, and several of them came. This was about 400 years ago. There had been rumors of the city, of, uh, a big city there in the jungle, but nobody knew where it was, even though some of the natives might have. But the city, by the time we found it 400 years ago, had already been abandoned for probably five or 600 years. You can visit today and a lot of those structures are still standing. Some of them are unsafe to go in because of, over time stone tends to crack and cake and crumble. But um, the city was Angkor Wat, and it began to construct a history who built this city and why. And uh, the city was built over a long period of time now, spoke something the National Geographic article said that I have not seen or heard since was that the first kings of Angkor were Hindu. But then as more and more of the common people became Buddhist, the kings later became Buddhist. But as long as they were Hindu, they were energetic and thriving and conquering. Then Buddhism taught them, accept what is and don't try to change things, just so what will be will be anyway. And Buddhism made them more passive and more accepting of the fact that they were crumbling and declining. Eventually, they had to move because their enemies the, to the north, the Viets on one side and uh, the other enemies on another, the, uh, began encroaching on them. And finally, they just could not keep up the, that big city. The city started to crack and crumble and decay, so they simply moved out in mass and built a city of Phnom Penh. The city is Angkor Wat. It's in the middle of the jungles of what is today, I believe, Maya, Cambodia. I believe it's today Cambodia. Um, again, like I say, since that National Geographic article, I've not seen anyone say that Hinduism uh, made them more energetic and Buddhism made them more passive and Buddha, they blame Buddhism for their eventual fall. The fact is, folk, civilized people have a tendency to decay and crumble from within, and eventually the uncivilized outnumber them. And this is one of the many, many examples of this throughout history. Um, and eventually, the, sometimes, like the whole area, what is today the United States, before the Europeans came, the United States had lost all of its civilizations and was now ruled by, I mean, overrun by uncivilized people who roamed around and tribal peoples. And a lot of Central Africa was the same way. Uh, they had once had central governments also, but eventually their central governments decayed. Same way with Angkor Wat, it was a city of a big capital city of a huge nation. And over time, it crumbled. Um, 
again, this is the way of mankind. And uh, could it happen to the United States? I had a student about two semesters ago say the United States cannot be conquered. Nobody else in the class seemed to agree with him. I certainly don't. All civilizations seem to eventually come to an end. Um, that's a different story. But I mean, actually, it's the same story you see repeated time and time and time again. Um, to this day, all these kingdoms still are influenced by India, uh, except for Vietnam, which is more influenced by China. Now, we're going to talk about Vietnam in chapter 11. All right. So much for now for India and Southeast Asia. I'll get home and start looking at my test. I'm going to give and say, well, I should have said this. I'll have more to say about it on Monday, I'm sure. But anyway, for right now, I'm going to move on to China. Um, chapter 10. I think of the Chinese people, folk, as the people who almost did but who didn't? But almost did what? Almost overspread the whole globe, almost spread their culture and way of life over the whole world, and perhaps almost conquered the whole world. They had it right in the grass, just on the verge, and right when they had it, it slipped right out of their fingers. They led the world in technology, in science, in inventions from about the year. 1500, I mean 500 at least to 1500. For that thousand year period, they had the most in the way of inventions. What all did they invent? I think I've listed them. I'll try to list a bunch of them. They invented porcelain, very useful, very important. Today's like porcelain. Porcelain is a type of plastic. It's used in capacitors to separate the plates of capacitors. It makes a very good dielectric. I mean, I'm sorry if most of you don't mean that word, but separates the two plates and batteries and capacitors. It's very important. It's also a non-corrosive uh, type of used in dishes, uh, cups, porcelain. They invented steel. Steel is lighter and stronger than iron. Without steel, we would not have our skyscrapers, our structural bridges. You can't make those things out of cast iron. But steel is very, very important to run also. But I hate to imagine automobiles made out of iron. Every time you had an accident, they would break like glass and it's also being horrible. Today's car is made of soft steel that gives and it keeps a lot of people alive who otherwise would be killed. Looks, the car may look bad after it's over with, but at least the soft steel protects the inhabitants. Um, but they, uh, let's see, they invented silk, they invented a wheelbarrow, they invented the printing press, they were the first known people to set up paper money without which you can't have a complex economy without paper money. Banks, and again, you cannot have industry, things like uh, railroads and airplanes and airlines without banks. Banks started in China. The banks, the banking business started in China, but it did not last. Their emperor said banks and paper money led to greed and stopped it. Um, I mean, again, uh, that way they had been the printing press. The printing press should have propelled them to the top of the world. I mean, because the printing press is the best, cheapest way to get knowledge across the whole realm. I mean, Thomas Edison, before he'd try a project, he'd look over the library and check out every book that had been written on the topic. Time and time again, I mean, Marconi read about somebody who'd made a spark gap, and he said, hey, why did he print it? Why did he make the radio? Uh, you, again, the, without the printing press, folk, your textbook would have cost, would have probably cost you $20,000 because it would take six months for somebody to print one up. I mean, if you can imagine that. Whereas today our machines can run them off at the rate of one a minute, one after the other. But uh, and they also we have robots that can put them together now, really, really fast. But uh, again, they they invented the printing press. Um, the inventions they made should have propelled them to the top of the world. They they on the verge, but right about the time they got to the top, their philosophers convinced their emperors that hey, you know, we're heading in the wrong direction. We need to concentrate more on morality. I mean, I can't say enough about morality, but uh, nevertheless, it only does certain, a certain amount. Uh, but um, now, when we left China last time, the end of chapter five, the Han Dynasty had fallen, 
And after the Han Dynasty fell, China went through a period of chaos called the Era of Six Dynasties. That is where the China, the one time in China's history, China was not united. And there were six different kings or nations or said to actually sometimes it might be five and sometimes it might be seven and sometimes down to three. But they went where they were like India for a while. Um, now we'll say this and then I'll close. One thing about the fact that, that China remained united throughout most of its history, that might have been a disadvantage because across the big continent of Eurasia, Europe split splintered into two or three hundred different independent countries. Well, of those countries, some of them found the way, the way of democracy, the way of uh, industriousness, the industrial revolution. Whereas China, if they had split into 50 countries, one or two of them might have led the rest of them. But as it was, being united might have been the thing that did them in. Because when their emperors went astray, but what if they had had 50 different countries, 50 different kings, one or two of them might have become industrialized and started an industrial revolution. And China might have bases on the moon and Mars by now, but that's one of those what ifs. As it was, they remained united. India didn't. Western Europe didn't. Unity might have been a problem more than it was a help. I'm going to close there, and everybody have a good weekend.